Now, if you look at the main engine of economic growth, like what really moves the living standards up, right? Ultimately, the answer is going to be a change in productivity, right? That's what's doing it. Economic growth, right, is a result of increasing the ability to make more and more out of less and less, right? Now, these, the sources of this increased productivity, you know, various people have proposed various ways. You know, division of labor was Adam Smith's uh, old idea, that whole pin factory thing. Uh, economies of scale, the fact that you, you know, uh, run large runs and then on a, on a sort of per unit basis, you basically end up to do some savings and so on yeah, out of Less and less, you can produce more and more. Specialization of exchange and trade, you know, David Ricardo, uh, an economist of one generation after, after Adam Smith sort of, uh, you know, figured out the, the basics of trade. But the fact is, you know, all of these are ultimately um, um, easily exhausted, but they run into diminishing returns very quickly, right? One thing that keeps on giving, right, and that's, you know, invention and innovation. And so, um, let me show you how. You know, innovation is a really curious thing. And let me illustrate this with this clip, video clip, which is at once funny and a little bizarre and actually quite insightful about the nature of technological change because it's a clip of technological change that does not quite work out. Let's hope that we'll have the sound. I mean, think about this, right? So this is, here's a guy who is an inventor and just in the context of it, it's created this invention sort of don't make any sense. They're like, they're, we know that these inventions are useful, but they're completely incomprehensible to them, right? It's that they're out of step, they're out of, out of context. So, when we talk about, you know, inventing new thing, it sounds simple and straightforward on the face of it, but it actually it's a really, really complicated problem. It's a really sort of, it's a really tough thing. It's a really complex, complex issue. So let me try to illustrate this in, uh, with, some, with some more sort of um, uh, real life, real history examples. So here's a question for you. Which invention has single-handedly made the Industrial Revolution possible? Any candidates? Well, so the water mill. The water mill actually dates back to the 7th century. So uh, it's, you know, it's an important one, but it's not exactly Industrial Revolution stuff. And steam engine actually comes up quite often. Right? So there's the power loom, uh, a sort of textile invention, the cotton gin, which allowed the processing of cotton that would then give rise to the English, uh, you know, dark satanic mills, the canal navy that made the, the transportation cheaper, and the answer of course is that all of these answers are wrong, right? There is no particular one invention, right? What happens in industrial revolution is that it's a wave of gadgets. It's lots of stuff. There is invention and inventive activity taking place along many frontiers at the same time. That's, that's what makes it so special. So if you look at the, the sort of long course of history, right? Here we have the, the ver the, these various flags are basically various intellectual achievements of humankind plotted against the rise in population. And so this hockey stick which is when the population as well as economic growth take off in the late 18th century, there also happens to be quite a proliferation of new ideas and new inventions, right? So it's a wave of that. And if you look at this, there's the steam engine and the railroads, but there is also germ theory, which is a medical advance, right? Uh, there is the, the, the airplane, there's automobile, penicillin, you know, DNA, all sorts of stuff, right? So it's not just one thing that, that, uh, that makes it happen, but steam engine still somehow usually gets the, 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 the pride of place. It's most likely so, uh, to be associated with the, the Industrial Revolution. It's the age of steam, blah, blah, blah. And usually the man, man who is credited with all of that is, is this guy, and his name is, anybody? It's not George Washington. <laughs> this is James Watt, right? He gets most of the credit, and that's because in 1769, he actually patented his new, find of new and improved steam engine. Uh, he's also famous for his partnership with Matthew Bolton. Uh, you know, Bolton and Watt, steam engines. Uh, if you wanted to buy a steam engine in 1700s, that's where you would go. And they would supply it to the whole wide world, right? They would even, you know, export steam engines to America. I mean, imagine that in the, in the you know, early 1800s that you would transport such a bubble thing across the Atlantic. But the point is, that he actually did not invent the steam engine, he only invented one particular improvement, the separate condenser, which I'll get to in a minute. Well, the steam engines have been in place already since 1712, right? They were called the Newcomen steam engines after their, after their, their author. And so, you know, he basically gets 
more credit than he deserves. And I want to sort of show you how we got to, to James Watt in the first place, right? The whole story actually begins already a hundred years before him when this guy, Otto von Gericke from Magdeburg, uh, demonstrated the power of atmospheric pressure. And he had these, these two teams of horses tied to this massive uh, metal sphere that was, that was hollow, and it was basically two hemispheres. And, and the air was pumped out of, uh, out of the inside, and he was trying to demonstrate that if you pump out the air, the horses will not be able to pull it apart. And they were not. It was like a big mirror. Like, wow, this vacuum, you know, it's, you know, it's not going it, to be pulled apart. I mean, he demonstrated this in this way, the, the power of atmospheric pressure. And this is already 1656, right? So this is 100 years before uh, James Watt. And then, you know, this guy, Dennis Papel, invents the pressure cooker, cooker where he basically uh, discovers that if there is a pressure of steam inside this, uh, inside this contraption, you need to put a little valve up there that's going to let off the steam, otherwise the steam is going to blow the whole thing up. But when he does that, he realizes that as, you know, that little valve is basically moving up. Every time the pressure builds up inside, right, the pressure sort of lifts up the valve and then escapes and then, you know, it descends. And so he sees this upward motion, it's like, hey, the steam is actually doing work here, right? It's moving things up and down. If you have enough pressure, maybe you could move bigger objects. And so it, it turns out that, you know, this can be used for motive power. And before long, in 1697, Thomas Savary, and this is, we're still in France at this point, we're still on the continent, right? Uh, he invents the first steam engine called the Miner's Friend, which pumps out water out of mines and therefore prevents or, or helps against flooding of mines. That's why it's called Miner's Friend. Like, nobody wants to drown in a hole, you know, 100 meters below surface. So these are sort of the first uh, steam engines that appear. And at that point, they jump across the Atlantic, and we have new Cummins atmospheric engine. So here you have a little gif of how it works, where you would have water that boils up, the steam goes in, and the pressure moves the piston. And every, uh, you know, in a sort of coordinated fashion, there is this uh, jet of cold water that always cools that steam in there. The steam condenses, and then the vacuum that, that results pulls the, steam, pulls the piston back down. And there you go. You have that, that, that motion upside down. And suddenly you have steam actually pulling quite a bit of load, right? And again, this was mostly used as pumps uh, in mines. It would pump out water of mines so that they wouldn't get flooded. So here we have a new Newcomen steam engine, a really big, bulky beast. Uh, but it's already working. It has like a massive efficiency of 1%. Right? You, you, you pour coal into this, and of all the energy embodied in that coal, 1% is doing useful work. This is sort of the, the rudimentary level of development that we have at this time. So that's new comments, I'm not sorry, this is 1712. And so, you know, this is, this is basically, these are the steps on which uh, James Watt was building. You know, he, his improvement was to introduce separate condensers. So unlike before, we would have the cylinder where the steam would, would sort of come in hot and then it would be also cooled here. He basically has steam come in, you know, do its work, and then it's sucked down through this vacuum pump which is connected to it, it's sucked out into here, and here it's condensed, right? So it's through, through this chamber that the vacuum is generated in all of the system and then, you know, the, the downward pressure comes in. This is actually a huge improvement because what it allows him is to you know, keep this hot and keep this cold, as opposed to the other uh, thing, the Newcomen engine, which had this, uh, this cylinder changing temperature, which is a real strain on the material, right? And so he actually improves, by having that separate condenser, he improves the efficiency of the steam engine fourfold. So now we're on to 4% efficiency. But you know, fourfold increase, that's actually a huge improvement, a fourfold improvement in productivity. So this is the reason why he gets all that credit. Because he, he, he improved the steam engine so significantly. And he wasn't done. He also was able to transform that up and down motion to circular motion using his sun and, sun and planet gear, which was a really interesting engineering problem because on some level you would think like, hey, why don't you just put a, you know, a shaft onto the wheel and, and you know, just let you have it at the railroad. The reason why he didn't is because that was patented and he couldn't use it. Right? He just wouldn't buy that. So he had to come up with something else, and so he came up with this thing. And that apparently was not an infringement on the patent, and so he, he, could, he could get that done. So now, you have up, up and down motion transformed into circular motion too. And he was still not done, James Watt. Uh, he also invented the double acting steam engine. Now look at this beauty. So what happens here is that you have this valve here moving up and down, and it's letting steam alternately 
on either side, and so the steam is double active. It's making uh, it's, it's made to work on either side of that moving piston. Right? While previously it was always just coming in from the bottom, there was just you know plain air up at the top. But here it's the whole piston is encased in the cylinder, and there is steam on either side of it, double acting steam engine. Now we're on to eight percent efficiency. I mean, this guy is really onto something, right, James Watt? All right, so this is what 1788. So th throughout this time, you know, he, this is 20 years of work that he is improving the, the, the steam engine. And so when, when Swat's fame, right, why is he famous? On some level, he was just one among many. He was far from the first or the only steam engine peddler, right? He, when he gets to work, he is already standing atop, you know, a century's work of other researchers before him. Right? So it's not like he came up with it first. He already comes to a lot of different ideas that are out there, and he's looking at various improvements, and he makes massive improvements. But the basic structure is, is, is practically in place, and he's making all these further enhancements to make it work better. Right? And so if you look at their, their, uh, the, the situation in England, even before James Watt, right? so this is, this is pretty good. You get the new common engine, the, the primitive one from 1712, right? It's already being used here before the first, you know, in the first third of the 18th century, and then it spreads. And then, you know, by the time you get to, uh, you know, the Bolton and Watt, they basically come in and they're competing with these older engines, and, and of course they're going to be winning because they have uh, a, a better working machine, right? But the point is that, you know, the reason why James Watt is famous, it's not just because he had these ideas, but because they would sell all these ideas. They made a successful business out of it. That's the point at which the invention actually turns into increased productivity. When I was a kid, you know, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, somehow, you know, the textbooks always made this point that whatever Western invention there was, there was always some Russian person who apparently made it just three weeks before that. <laughs> right? Yeah. What I'm saying here is that I don't know if, you know, different people do different things, and for all I know, there could have been some, you know, Vasilisky and Jensen who really did figure it out before everybody else. But the point is, the reason why it did make a dent in England, and it did not make a dent in Russia, which we do know for sure, is because here they would actually sell it. If you just have a blueprint, the innovation is as good as useless, right? But the difference here is that it's not just an inventor James Watt, but it's inventor James Watt, with the businessman Matthew Bolton, who make a, a, a point of selling these engines to the whole wild world, mostly to Britain, but, but pretty much to everybody else who, who shows up, right? So one important thing uh, that, that emerges from this is that the demand for new technologies is derived from the demand for goods of final consumption, such as textiles, such as coal, you know, for the, all the mining steam engines. So the large final goods market matters, right? In Russia, which was at that time significantly poorer than Britain, you know, this market did not exist. And so even if all those claims about the actual inventors were true, uh, you know, of which many are actually dubious, uh, they still would not sort of be worthy of much attention because they basically, within the Russian context, were dead ends. Nobody was there to actually take up these inventions and use them and employ them and make money of them and thereby make them work for the general economy. And so, you know, when Watson does this, Sorry, when, when what, uh, James Watt does this, right, he does this basically in response to these market incentives, and he is not the first or the last in the line of these inventors. In fact, the story of steam engine continues, right? So here is a guy, Robert Trevithick, who decides to improve the steam engine further, and he invents this uh, high pressure core steam engine. And on the face of it, it looks pretty much the same, but the point was that he was going to, to increase the pressure of steam engine within that piston. To, to get even more work than the 8% that Watt was doing. The problem was, the reason why this is 1802 patented is because James Watt was dead set against this. The high pressure steam engines were much more dangerous, they were more likely to explode. They also had higher efficiency, so they were more cost effective, but sometimes they could blow up on you, right? And so James Watt basically was holding this patent and said, no steam engine is this, and there's not going to be any increase in pressure beyond my specification because this is dangerous to people and I will fight it tooth and nail. And finally, in 1800, his patent expires and so Trevithick can step in and actually invent, uh, you know, or, or, or patent his high-pressure steam engine and say, this is, there's another way of, of, of doing this. It turns out 
that James Watt was wrong and Trevithick was right because it was the high pressure steam engine that actually was the way of the future. The high pressure steam engine, unlike the, the low pressure one, you can actually put on wheels. The low pressure steam engine of James Watt is this really, it's like sometimes if you have it next to a factory, it's like a separate building, all right? You cannot put it on wheels and drive it anyway. This, you can, right? And so by 1806 or something like that, uh, next to where one is the useful station, he puts this uh, little show, you know, for everybody. He puts a little show where he, where, he, where he gives rides to the onlookers with this primitive, uh, primitive steam locomotive. And so this is sort of like a proof of concept show, right? This can work. This can transport people. If you just, you know, generate the, the infrastructure and the network, this could really connect continents. Uh, so, so he basically, through this, he invents the locomotive, right? And then still the, the, the invention goes on. So here is the Collis steam engine, and by this time we're getting into the, the, the American continent. I think Collis is an American. And so what he invented was an improvement in those valves that let the steam in and out. Right? So what you see here is that the red is the hot steam, and then and, and the, uh, the, the blue is the sort of condensed, cool down steam. And that, uh, and that valve that's sort of circulating you know, up there, moving back and forth, is again exposed to lots of double temperature, hot on the outside, you know, cold on the inside. And again, it's a great strain on the material. So Coley says, I have a solution for this. He basically turns, uh, you know, the valves into four separate pieces that can, that can be actually regulated individually. And these ones are the exhaust valves, so they deal with the cold stuff, and those are the inlet valves, so they deal with the, the hot stuff. Right, so you can sort of design them to specification there. They're also easily regulable individually, as opposed to you know the other one, which was one piece and it was always had to move in, in a particular way. And so again, that increases the, the the efficiency of the steam engine. So that by 1876, at the Centennial Exhibition, right, President Ulysses Grant comes to open this exhibition and he opens it by you know by switching on this, this steam steam engine that powers the whole exhibition. Uh, again, as you can see, this was actually one of those uh, one of those more durable uh, low pressure steam engines that would be stationary and big, you know, and actually would, would power the whole exhibition. So, what happens here is that what you have is basically two centuries of gradual improvement of this one particular thing. Right? The technological change is very incremental in nature. Right? Uh, and so there is this this thin red line between invention, which is like a big new concept. Such as you know, Otto von Guericke's idea that atmospheric pressure is powerful. When he, again, as a proof of concept, he has those two hemispheres that cannot be pulled apart. That's just a proof of concept. At that point, it's not useful. It's 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 not productive or anything. It's just an interesting idea, right? But it's, it's the innovation, the piecemeal incremental improvement that actually makes it practicable and employable, right? Um, and so that that has some in interesting and important implications, right? One is industrial revolution is not really a place for hero worship, right? James Watt gets, gets built up, but really there's like a whole stream of people on whose work he's relying on. And then there's another stream of people who rely on his work in turn. So this hero worship, you know, this was all done by a few people. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is not quite uh, accurate, right? Similarly, it does not follow that technological, uh, intellectual, in, industrial revolution was the result of dumb technological luck. You know, somebody suddenly chancing upon this idea. No, if this is 200 years of consistent intellectual effort, right? This, this spans more than a few lifetimes, right? So there must be something in the underlying trend, something in the environment that allows this continuous effort to go on. There must be enough sort of infrastructure, let's say enough a sufficiently educated audience that would listen to these ideas and think about them, maybe improve upon them. There must be a milieu, to use the French word, that, that gives rise to these inventors generation after generation, and that also gives rise to lots of the sort of, uh, you know, the secondary users, maybe people who are not necessarily on the frontier, but who are mechanics, who can fix things, and who can still understand it and know how to, to put it into work and, you know, fix s simple problems, things like this, right? So. Uh, this is definitely the result of, of some technological dumb luck, right? There was something that these technologically advancing societies were doing right that led to all these activities producing new kind of ideas. So it's a persistent ongoing intellectual effort across generations. Of course, the, the, uh, 
if we were asking about what, what made that milieu possible, right, again, institutional determinants would be the first thing that would come to our mind, right? And it would very significantly sort of loom in the forefront that, that the inventor was teamed up with an entrepreneur, Bolton, right? Money was involved. There was a way to make a buck off this, to make a really profitable long-term business. Um, and so, you know, not surprisingly, people actually would, would, would take up all this activity and, and, and make, it, make it so. One interesting thing that sort of a contrast that is frequently sort of uh, pointed out in economic history is that when you look at the early research into this, you get, you know, you get names like uh, Papin, you know, and, and von Guericke, and these are basically continentals. A lot of them are Frenchmen. But the inventions themselves actually start first working in England. So it's not that the French are sort of, you know, technologically backward or stupid or anything. No, no, they have the, the Royal Academy and everything, you know. There is plenty of scientific output taking place in, in France. But there is also plenty of, of little regulation, feudal privileges and things like that in, in 18th century France that prevent you from reaping the benefits of selling it to the whole market. England, by contrast, basically if you, if you produce in Yorkshire, you can sell it in Kent or in Scotland, you know, wherever. Uh, and so you can reap the, you know, the benefits of, of, of catering to a large market. Uh, this already changed the incentives of, on, uh, in terms of which way the intellectual activity would be directed, right? The French, uh, you know, great minds, go into publishing scientific papers, you know, things that are not necessarily patented and they're not interested in making a buck out of it. The English, on the other hand, form partnerships to make these ideas practicable. So James Watt probably does not have, you know, a scientific paper to his name, but he has patents to his name and he has a business to his name, you know, and he has, uh, uh, and he has all this, uh, all this trade going on. Uh, one other thing that emerges, one of the patterns that, that emerges from this is that there is potentially a long time between concept and successful implementation. Right? So when people say, when does the Industrial Revolution start? If it consists of a wave of gadgets that, that are of this kind, chances are you know, it's going to be very difficult to time it precisely. It's more like a, this really gradual creep. Right? At first, maybe it's just really a few kind of bizarre things that don't make much sense to anybody outside, but gradually they build up, and suddenly, you know, that 1% or half a percent annual growth adds up to big differences if you, if you uh, have it go over a long period of time. Yes, one other thing that emerges from this, one other pattern, is that frontier research is inherently unpredictable, right? And so that's the reason why I brought up this, brought up this, this uh, discussion between James Watt and Robert Trevithick. These are both engineers. These are the people on the cutting edge. These are the people in the know. And yet, you know, they have this, this complete falling out, and it's the established, prestigious, uh, you know, well-regarded James Watt who is wrong. And it's the young whippersnapper, Robert Trevithy, who actually was right. It's, it's really hard at any stage to predict which, if you're on the frontier, if you're like the cutting edge of research, it's very hard to predict where the next step is going to be, right? What is the next technology that's going to work out? Even James Watt got it wrong, and he was in the business, right? So, so uh, you know, this, for example, has important implications for, you know, government research and development policy, right? If you set up a committee to devote resources to R&D, you're basically making a bet as to which way the, the research is going to go next. Chances are, if he got it wrong, you're going to get it wrong also. So most of the time when governments, uh, you know, spend money on R&D, you know, inevitably has to be very clearly focused um, and uh, frequently they basically invest in, in, uh, in guns that, that you know, don't pan out or you don't need to anything. When you talk to economists, it's marginal this, marginal that, you know, marginal everything. Why are we so obsessed about the margin? I mean, so here we have a steam engine, the first one that actually is practicable and employable. And of course it was not the first thing in, in the use of energy. We talked about the water mill, and in fact water mill historically was the main competitor of the steam engine. Now from an engineering point of view, an engineer is going to be mightily impressed with the steam engine because for an engineer it's like, wow, you built this whole thing from scratch, right? really all these things need to come together to produce energy, right? But for an economist, the question is, is going to be, well, how significantly better is this new gizmo? Let's say the, the water mill has a productivity that you're going to call 100, you know, some sort of baseline. Well, if the steam engine only has a productivity of 103, it's still going to impress the engineer, but the economist is like going to be, well, you know, is this something to write home about? It's worth having an extra 3% of productivity, yes. 
but it's like, you know, a little improvement, right? So the fact that something is new does not necessarily mean that it's a, it has a large impact on productivity immediately. So if this is the case, you know, under the, I'm just, I just made up these numbers for, for argument's sake, but if the steam engine is only 3% better than the water power, then yes, it's going to be profitable, yes, it's going to be in, you know, employed, but at first you're actually not going to see much of an impact, right? It's a massive, you know, a whole new engineering idea, but economically the impact is only the extra three percentage points that you're getting there, right? And it's only when the steam engine starts improving further and further, you know, that you're going to see further improvements. Now, having said that, I'm actually setting myself up for a further argument. Thing is, water power does not just take this lying down, the you know, encroachment of the steam power. And so the water power, uh, you know, strikes back. The, there were three kinds of wheel, uh, water wheel that were being used, the uh, uh, undershot, overshot system, and then the, the breast, uh, breast wheel, right, that was sort of halfway through. And as the steam power is sort of making gradual encroachments, you know, there are engineers, you know, who are also working on improving the, uh, the, the, the steam power, right? So you can see that actually water wheels were, were quite widespread all over England, uh, even as like as, as 1800s. Um, so when water power strikes back, right, one of the ways in which it happens is, is uh, through this French engineer, Jean-Victor Poncelet, who decides to, instead of, you know, having these simple straight blades, he curves them a little, and he pays close attention at which degree, at which uh, inclination, the water hits these plates, so as to extract the last drop of power out of, uh, you know, out of every drop of moving water. And so he increases, he, you know, he doubles the efficiency of the of the uh, uh, undershot wheel. But it, it turns out that the that the frontier in water power lies somewhere else, right? This Hungarian guy, Janusz Seger. Uh, toys in 1750s with this idea that if you have this, this hollow uh, tube and you send water through this and then you have these jets at the end, as the water is leaving, you know, this sort of stuff, the whole thing is going to rotate. And this is the beginning of the water turbine, right? Uh, they use a supply idea. Basically what he does, he has this wheel in the middle. I, unfortunately, I only found a Hungarian picture, but you're smart people who figure this out. So this wheel over here, you can see a sort of, uh, you know, top-down picture up there. So the, the, the inside wheel, those blades over here, are fixed. And then water falls through over here, and these fixed inside blades, they, they you know, expel the water out. Now the outside wheels, those actually do move, right? And so in some sense, what, what Forneron did was he took that water wheel and he put it on the side, and instead of having just one blade work, the one that's being hit by water on a standing wheel, he now has all the blades hit at the same time, right? It's a, again, it's a, it's a massive improvement. So as the water comes in, you know, the inner blades pull it out, and then every of the outside blades is actually hit also. And so suddenly, we're with 80% efficiency. 80% of, of, of all the energy inherent in that moving water is extracted for useful, for useful work. Uh, and it doesn't stop there, right? Then you get uh, James Francis, so now we're moving to America, so he improves the, uh, he improves the efficiency by making that, uh, the, the tube that, that leads water to the turbine sort of gradually narrow down, and that speeds up the water, so there is also you know, a hit into the turbine that, that improves the, the rotation. You get Pelton wheel, right? So Lester Pelton, uh, this is what is called the impulse turbine. So the turbines, you know, split into several kinds also. Where you know the, the crux of this idea is is the is the Pelton wheel, where all these blades are very specifically shaped. So as the water comes in, right, and it, as it comes out again, all the energy in that water is imparted to that wheel. Nothing is lost. Now Kaplan makes a further improvement by changing the the slope of the blade. So these are all basically tiny improvements that are always looking at how can I get the next little bit out of it so that there's nothing left in that water when it leaves the turbine, right? And of course the result of all that is that by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, there is a turbine for almost every river, every water situation that you can have. You might have you know, mountain streams that have very little water, but they're really fast. Well, use the Pelton wheel. Or maybe you have the Danube, you know, the Mississippi, which is a really wide river, but it's kind of lazy. You have lots of water moving, but it's moving slowly. Well, then use the, use the Kaplan turbine, right? So there is basically a, 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 there is, there is a, you know, something for any particular use. And, uh, as this uh, improvement uh, goes on, right, uh, there is, there is um, you know, the, the, the old technologies fight back. But 
the improvement is not only intensive, you know, improvements in efficiency, but also extensive, right? Improvement in the scope of uses. So while some of the original water wheels were only usable for particular rivers, by the time we get to the end of the century, there is a turbine for any environment, anywhere, all the time. Um, and so it, it, you know, suddenly all, all areas that previously were closed, next these, these uh, developments are open now because there is an energy to be had, right? Uh, so good portion of the productivity does not come necessarily from new gizmos, but from the improvement of the old ones, right? That again, that shows you that the, the inventive activity is broadly based. Um, this shows you also the importance of, of competitive market, right? Open to entry. This competition is on and, and it's yielding benefits continuously throughout this time. Um, now, of course, what does that tell you, for example, about the you know, innovation policy that you might have? Again, talking about institutions in place, right? So policy usually implies some irony focus, right? In, uh, the, the, the emphasis on some particular thing that you want to uh, that you want to, to explore. Usually, this means you know the focus means that you're going to, to focus on the intensive improvement, making the productivity higher, rather than the extensive margin, which is lots of different things being tried. Now, um, you know that you always somewhat invite the risk of possible entrenchment, right? That if there is a particular line of research that is getting lots of government money, you know, to sub sub subsidize that research initially, you might actually end up uh, entrenching that. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the bad kind of fighting back, right? The political entrenchment where sort of new technologies are suddenly banned from a particular market because they might ha hamper, you know, the existing R&D. And so, you know, the problem is that new technologies will likely be disruptive, right? This is always a big political question. Uh, you know, I, you know, as you can see, I'm a complete cheerleader for, for new technological development. But this needs to be stressed, right? That the technologies do not only increase the size of the pie, but they also affect the division of the spoils, right? So if you invest in the wrong technology and then the technology does not pan out, you are going to lose money. There, there, there are plenty of examples of this, right? The, the water power was fighting but partly because they were being pushed out, you know, by, by the steam engines, right? Somebody who invested in the Zeppelins in the early 20th century, of course, after the Hindenburg catastrophe, was out of their money because it turns out it was aircraft as the future of, of air flight, right? So, so these technologies are, are inevitably disruptive and, of course, there is a political, you know, pushback, right? So you heard about Luddites, right? Luddites were people who felt that the technology was stealing their jobs and so they would show up in factories and they would smash these, smash these, uh, these new engines because they said, you know, uh, this, is, this is actually, a, you know, this is going all downhill, otherwise we're going to end up all unemployed and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, there were people who were standing to lose, right? Every time you invent a machine that replaces somebody's work, that somebody needs to retool because they're out of their job. So, as a result, you know, inventive activity is actually, as I say, it's a, it's a very peculiar, it's a very sort of tame animal. It can be easily scared away. It can be easily killed. It is a goose that lays the golden egg. But if you're not careful, uh, you know, it's, it's not very easy to actually maintain it because there are lots of good reasons why new technology gets opposed from various quarters, right? Not so good press of inventive activity. Uh, there is ridicule, right? Uh, people are, uh, are, many of these inventors originally are, are cast as complete cranks, which is not a, a very conducive thing for their success, should they have one, because it basically isolates them and a lot of the inventive activity relies on, on communication and cooperation, right? Uh, there is demonization, right? This guy is, uh, is onto something, is onto something bad, you know. So the, the Luddism, you know, excommunications bans. We sort of know a lot of these from from church history, but uh, I think you know the 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 Uber story from France. You know, that's, that's, that's a sort of similar thing, right? Uh, the skepticism, right? This guy is a charlatan. This is never going to work. Uh, and then inventive activity is seen as a waste, is it? Because it rarely, like there are lots of dead ends, uh, as I'm going to show you. Right? So the, the problem is that most of the time, these criticisms are actually accurate. There are lots of charlatans, there are lots of cranks. If you go to any of those you know, uh, conferences, the venture capital conferences, you will find lots of people who basically just you know, don't know what they're talking about. And they will try to, to, to you know, sell you their crazy idea because you know that you have money, right? So a lot of the time, these objections are actually spot on. Most of the activity does end in other failure, right? The techno frontier is replete with, with cracks, charlatans, and, uh, and, and snake oil salesmen. Let me show you an example. So consider the invention of the bike. 
right? That's, that's actually, I mentioned the Koran, it's, it's a good one. People will start trying to improve on it just like they try to improve on the steam engine. So for example, here is this, uh, you know, a double. If you want to take your girlfriend on a date, you can get a double bike. And that didn't catch on, did it? We don't buy these in the store. Uh, yeah, you can buy a bike that's basically a single wheel where you are on the inside, and so when you fall, it sort of protects you, I guess. Uh, oh, here is a foldable bike. Uh, this one did somewhat catch on. There was even like a French military regiment, you know, with the bikers, and they would have it on. And so they could quickly move, you know, from battlefield to battlefield before the Germans would mow them down with an Um So it did somewhat catch on. You know, actually in, in London you can see people having these and taking them on trade. But it's not like the most popular use of a bike, right? Then there is this bike where you can do some pedaling with your arms, right? so if you need a proper workout, it also speeds you up a little bit. So this is just pedaling with your, with your feet, it's also, you know, that didn't catch on much either, you know. This guy was a, maybe onto something good, but, you know, this just did not pan out. Yeah, a bike with a, with a camera on it. So like, if you want to take a ride and take, you know, pictures while you're, uh, while you're at it, then this, this, this is the bike that you need to buy, right? Don't buy a bike and a ca camera separately. By this massive contraption, and then you have it all in one piece. And then you have this thing, right? Which is the idea that you take a bike and you put a little engine on it, and then it's gonna... Actually, this one did catch on. This is the motorbike. Now that I'm thinking about it. So there you have it. You know, seven different uh, improvements of the bike. And some of them are just complete losers. Some of them are, you know, complete dead ends. But some of them actually do catch on, right? And they become motorbike. And then there's, you know, the whole industry coming out of that. Right, so, so one other benefit of competition is failings, right? The market sends out signals what is going to work and what is not. If you don't have that, again, this is going to be very difficult to sort of redirect your resources towards those enterprises that are going to be most positive. And so the secret to the Western success compared to other, you know, this is actually quite interesting, right? You have that open access market of ideas. You have relatively low cost of failure because if you invent something like a bike with a camera, you know, you do a prototype and people will laugh at you and then you cut your losses and go do something else. So the cost of failure, painful though it is, and from a social point of view, is actually still pretty low, right? Well, some guy, you know, lost his money making a prototype. I mean, yeah, it's not pleasant, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, and this includes, you know, open venture capital market, right? So, yeah, somebody loses money in, a, in, a, in an app or in a invention that doesn't pan out. It's sad, but it's not the end of the world, right? Uh, but you have high reward for success. Right? So low, low cost of failure, high reward of success, it's going to be, there will be lots of trial, right? This is, the reason, this is the reason why the industrial economies became industrial. It's not because the Westerners were smarter or more educated or had better books or anything. No, it's because they tried more often. It's nothing but the law of large numbers, basically, operating in the background. And the law of large numbers operates because of this, you know, low cost of failure, high, high benefit from reward, right? Uh, so, in some sense, the difference between the West and the rest is simply one of degree, not of substance, right? Uh, it's just that, you know, people in, uh, you know, China or in the, the Middle East or in Africa or in Latin America, they do some trying too every day, you know? Those people are also thinking, how can I improve my lot? But because the payoffs were different in Europe, you know, the profits were potentially really high and the, and the costs were potentially relatively low, you were not going to get burnt on stake in Europe by, you know, 1700s. There were more trials taking place in Europe, also more failures, that's why we get all those funny photos, but also more successes. And, you know, when the failures are cheap and the successes generate big benefits, then you're going to, over the long run, you're going to get lots of, uh, lots of good, uh, good new technologies coming out of this. I mean, ultimately, you know, uh, I'm basically linking simple, you know, few institutional features, how the market works, you know, how the capital market works and the final goods market works, you know, uh, is there a big punishment if you get it wrong? The answer is no in Europe. And then the rest is basically a response to incentives, which at, at the particular nature of how ideas, how ideas operate, right? That if you invent it once, nobody else has to invent it again because the idea is around. And so this is basically what, what happened. Now, uh, how does this all link to education? Right? Now, innovation definitely is an intellectual activity. If you look at the early inventions in the early 19th century, it turns out that those are usually fairly straightforward mechanical contractions. 
Some of these improvements, as you could see, was just a matter of you know changing the slope of a blade on a water wheel. It's, it's, this is not rocket science. Right? Rocket science only comes later. So, so at first, actually, these inventions do not require that much formal education, and they produce machines that, that they themselves, the, the machines, do not require much, much education to operate, right? So does technological change reward education? Not always, you can have capitalized technological change. So the most obvious example from, from modern time is, are these, uh, you know, when you go to, to a store, the grocery store, you know, at the checkout, I still remember a time when there was a person at the front who had to be able to do the sums believe it or not. Right? This was in the early 80s. And today, you know, this would obviously slow down the whole process, so the computer does it, you know, there is the, the, the barcode reader, and in fact, in, in many stores, they're basically replacing all those, you know, checkout people with machines where you do it all yourself. And, you know, you do it quickly, and you, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, there is a technological invention that basically was dumbing down the work done at the, at, the, at the checkout and then completely replacing the individual entirely, right? So you can have inventions that actually lead to de-skilling, right? But, but often, uh, you know, the, the new inventions, such as this laptop, actually are inventions that reward some skill and some education, right? So to operate this, this wondrous machine with, you know, which, with, with which you can do almost anything you want and is going to require a mouse, uh, that actually does reward education, right? So early industrial revolution technological change was often de-skilling, but as you move through, by mid-19th century, it became more involved technologically, it became more complex, and therefore required more literacy, more education, and so as a result of that, you see an education boom. That's the reason why, across the developed world, suddenly there is this massive demand for more schools, literacy, even some technical education, and even the curriculum gradually changes from classical education into biology, into chemistry, into physics, into all these fields. Let me show you. So here, for example, is a graph that shows you the years of schooling by birth cohort for U.S., people who are born in the U.S., starting with the people born in 1870, and so we have eight years of schooling for the people who were born in uh, 1870 on average, and you can see how, how this, this basically grows significantly. So by the time we get to people born in 1980, you know, those are who are 35 today, so you can sort of argue that they are done with their education career. That overall education has increased from less than eight years, maybe seven, up to, up to 15, right? So there is this massive boom in education, and this is just looking at basically what's post-secondary, or, or secondary and post-secondary, right, if you start at eight. But of course, already before that, this is, for example, one policy response uh, by individual government, right? This is uh, the passage of initial compulsory schooling laws by individual states. So each dot here is a state legislating compulsory schooling on the primary level. And so, basically starting in the mid-19th century, there's a sudden interest in making the kids go to school, and with that also comes the provision of these schools, because it turns out these machines, the modern industrial uh, economy, and even the mechanized agriculture, it's going to require people who actually are able to understand the principles of these basic level. They need to be able to read the manuals, they need to be able to, to, to write letters, you know, that they need repairs, whatever, or, you know, complain, things like this. So, so all this is basically leading to this response. Uh, in terms of educational policy to, to, to bring about all these schools, right? So most of the improvement in education, right, uh, in the elementary schools comes in the 19th century, especially towards the end. Uh, basically, America is on the cusp of a big high school boom, right? So only 20%, and by the time we get to 2000 suddenly, 25% uh, of the population, but I have only here, of course, because the ambition is always to take this number higher, but this is the highest number that you will find in history, right? Like. Uh, pretty much across the board, right? Tiny proportions of people would have completed university education before the 20th century, right? The fact that we're a quarter uh, is quite significant, right? And here you can see how uh, how did the high school enrollment uh, changed uh, basically throughout the, the 19th century, and uh, it, it shows you both the U.S. figures and the, the the West, West, North, Central. It turns out those were the because of the competition for the new settlers coming in, many of the Western states were actually on the forefront um, of, of providing these educational establishments. But as you can see, you know, the overall US was basically following them with a trend, right? So, so there is this massive, you know, with a blip during the Second World War, there is this massive increase throughout the 20th century of people coming into uh, the high school so that by the time we get to the end, 
we're basically looking at enrollment rates uh, of 90%. There have been massive changes. Uh, this also means that the proportion of people who only have elementary school, you know, going from 1915 to the end of the century, is declining. And so, you know, the median, you could say, education there suddenly is some college. While over there, even 100 years ago, median uh, educational attainment was just simple high school. Now, why did we all do this? Because, you know, this education, complementary to the technology, ultimately increased everybody's productivity, right? So that's what we see here. This is log labor productivity. Uh, so that's natural log of non farm hourly labor productivity, right? And then you can see that it goes from 3.2 to 5.2. It basically means it. An increase by 2 means that it doubled twice, right? From 3.2 to 5.2. So these are these are big gains as a result of this education meeting technology. Um, you can actually show that in growth accounting too, right? So if you look at why is the economy growing, right? So partly it could be because we have more land, or we have more labor, more people working, or because we have more capital, or because we have better technology and we have more education. And so if you split that, you know, for the early, uh, sorry, the late 19th century and, and the first half of the 20th century, if you take the whole overall growth. Right on, of per capita, um, uh, of per capita income. Right, where is this coming from? Is it because we have more capital to work with, or because we have more land to work with, or is it because of technology? Right, and it turns out that technology is more than half of it. And initially, the you know, technology is sort of broadly conceived as uh, you know intellectual stuff. <coughs> this 57 percent consisted of a little bit of education, so a few people who were literate and were able to use it productively, and the rest was basically the steam engines and you know the railroads and all that doing their shtick. By the time we get to the early 20th century, uh, education suddenly becomes a much, uh, much bigger part of the overall growth, even as you know technology is still actually quite significant. Right. So what happens with this, this technological change is that it starts slowly, it improves incrementally. And gradually it moves into ever more sophisticated gizmos, you know, the pinnacle of which is, is the computers, let's say. And as that changes the requirements, the sort of demands on us, the users, also increase. We suddenly need to be more skilled, more flexible, sort of have better insight into what it does and what it doesn't do. And so education rises quite in, you know, in the logical correlation with our life. And so that's, that's the conclusion that I have for you today, right? Successful technological change is a result of long-term, ongoing, persistent, incremental effort, right? Think about this. If you look at all the world's revolutions that really changed people's lives for the better, right? The political revolutions, such as the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution, they get lots of, lots of press. But oftentimes you find that it doesn't really change anything on the ground. But the industrial revolution, that is something that you can actually you know, see improving people's lives. It just really takes a long time of lots of little incremental changes. But when it's done, even the Joe Schmoes actually feel the effects of it. And you know, that's the reason why we, why we can have all this, right? Uh, yeah, the, the, this is not some you know, chancy dumb luck. As I say, it was long-term ongoing effort. There must be something in the underlying institutional environment. Uh, the particular features that we would see operating here would be low cost entry into the market, uh, you know, some protection of the currently marginal IDS so that the cranks don't get completely, you know, voted out of society. But there is also safeguard against entrenchment by existing technologies, right? So that uh, the water power can fight back, but it can only f it fights back in, in a way that's not dirty by banning the steam engine. But you know, trying to improve your game. And education matters. And it matters how it interacts with technology, right? Uh, you can have a situation where the technology actually requires less and less skill. Uh, but we also, you know, as it happened historically, we basically ultimately get technology that, got, that needed ever more skill. And so you know, education can be useless if done badly. And that was the reason behind the changes in the curricula, right? That by still by the late 18th century, you get lots of classics and people can recite Greek and Latin and all that. And that it turns out that if you're operating a telegraph, you know, knowing ancient Greek is just completely useless. And so they say, well, why don't you learn some French, you know, especially if you're communicating with friends. Uh, and so the, 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 the curriculum changes. And modern technology then created demand for universally widely available schooling.